The Caribbean Policy Development Center, in collaboration with the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nitabaro Unit, and UETV, have partnered on a project titled Voices of Women, which seeks to highlight women from Barbados and the wider Caribbean, reflecting on their work in the areas of education, community development, development work, healthcare, and politics. It is comprised of a series of interviews recorded by UETV featuring women with rich and diverse backgrounds. Today on Voices of Women, we highlight Professor V. Eudine Barato. I was born in Grenada in the deep country, uh, Sotea St. Patrick's, a fishing village, and my father was a fisherman farmer, and my mother a housewife. I was the last of eight children, um, and uh, sorry, the second, the last girl. There was, she had six girls and two boys, and I was the last girl, but the seventh child. And uh, my mother and father separated when I was about seven or eight, so she moved into the town, St. George's, and then moved to Barbados. She moved before me, and I later joined her in Barbados, about two or three years after she was here. And I've lived in Barbados continuously since then. Went to school at Ellerslie Secondary, uh, where I finished uh, secondary school. I, I started Ellerslie at 13 years old. 13 going on 14. And when I, when I came to Barbados, I was too old to do the 11 plus exam. So I went an all age school at the time, girls school, St. Matthias girls. And the teachers there, God bless them, decided, because I didn't understand what was happening to me. They decided I was very bright and they tra asked for, to have me transferred. And they said, take this letter, give it to your mother, tell her go to Ellerslie. And she did that and I was at Ellerslie and I loved it because I started doing subjects that were different. French and biology and history and so on. And from Ellerslie, I remember distinctly, I used to see the students at the University of the West Indies and they looked so bright, the men and women, and they had big afros and the dashikis, and they're coming down free hill with books and, you know, and they just look cool and they got the beads and the sandals. And I said, university students look so bright. And when I finished Ellerslie at 17 with six O levels, a friend said to me, let's go to Cable. And I said, no, the students too bright. So I went, I got a job teaching at St. George Secondary and I went to Erdiston Teachers College in service program first and then the two year professional certificate program, teachers certificate program. And then I, I the same friend said, well, let's go to Cable. I said, yes, I'm ready. So I did come to Cable much later. And it seems as if since I came, I haven't left because I did a first degree here, 1976 to 1980 in the Faculty of Social Sciences immediately started working at the then Institute for Social and Economic Research with Patrick Emanuel as a research fellow. But while I was working there, the Women in the Caribbean Project was very much on. And Margaret Gill was there, and Diane Cummins, and Roberta Clark. And they were the other research assistants. I went to, I got a, a scholarship, a last Powell Fulbright scholarship to do a master's, which I did at New York University in public sector, uh, I think public administration, specializing in public sector financial management. Very interesting, right? And then I got a scholarship. I came back, worked as a junior research fellow, became a research fellow, publications editor, um, started doing my own writing. Actually, I was writing from a research assistant. And then I got another scholarship, God bless scholarships, to do a PhD at Howard University. And I did a PhD in political science. And my, my two majors were political theory. Um, I, it, it's, it's two majors and a minor. Political theory, was it? Political economy and um, international relations. Within political theory, I then specialized in feminist theory. I came back here. I changed fields because I went down to do mainstream political economy and fell in love with a course called Philosophy of the Social Sciences taught by a feminist scholar. And it just lick up my head. I mean, it was like really falling in love. I couldn't leave the discipline alone. And I came back here. I remember I was married at the time and I remember telling my husband, I'm changing midstream. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but I can't go back to mainstream political science. This is too enjoyable. But I came back to Kville and I said, God loves me. Because within a year of coming back, the Center for Gender and Development Studies had been created. And they asked me if I was interested. I said, are you crazy? This, I mean, to find a job in an area you have just finished your PhD, it was manna from heaven. And so, so I came back to Kville in 1993. No, I came back here ABD in 1992. 
and I've been here ever since. So, but, but when you think of my years as an undergrad student and at ISO, it's as if I've spent more than half my life at Keyville and enjoyed it, still enjoying it. <laughs> I love teaching. The job at St. George Secondary gave me a lot of pleasure. I love teaching. I miss graduate teaching even as we speak. Sometimes I feel quite sorry for myself because I'm, I'm at heart a, a, a lecturer and a researcher and I miss the classroom. I miss engaging with undergraduate and especially graduate students. But when I was coming to university, actually my love has always been politics. But never, I never wanted to be a politician. I always wanted to study politics because I was fascinated by power. And politics is the study of power, it's distribution. And I remember, however, as a, a young person, the dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences was uh, Mr. Wendell McLean. And he would interview all the new students coming in. So I told him I wanted to do international relations, political science. And he said, and what are you going to do with that? And I said, I don't know, but I want to do it. And, and then he said, you better do public administration. So of course your dean is telling you that and you're afraid you're not gonna work after. So I hedge my best and do something safe, public administration. I actually have a minor in accounting, which is very amusing to my um, executive assistant, Deborah Dean, because anything with accounts, I say, Deborah, please do that. She said, who has the minor again? But it's like, it was like trying to be safe so that I would, cause I was leaving, I was at that point a qualified teacher professional teacher, but I didn't want to go back into teaching. So I wanted to do something that would take me out. The Faculty of Social Sciences had just been created. And the dean tell me, don't do political science, do public administration. So I did that. When I was going to do the masters again, I wanted to go back to political science. I spoke to him again. And he said, what are you going to do with that? You have to do something where you will be employed. I listened to my dean. I did public sector financial management. I did all courses in public finance. Passed them really very well too. Got very good grades. When it came to the PhD, I said, you know what? The PhD is a lonely individual journey. I don't want to hear from anybody. I am doing what I want to do. I won't lose the degrees I have but I will, I, I will build on them. So I went to Howard University to do a, a PhD in political science, in political economy. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, I met, um, took this course called um, Philosophy of the Social Sciences, which is one of the courses all students are supposed to take. And the, 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 the woman was a very good political theorist and, and philosopher, Jane Flax. And I, because although she, she taught the founding fathers of political theory, she interrogated it, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Locke, all the, the you know, coming right up Hegel and so on. And what she did, she taught the, the theory, but then she thought like the juxtaposition of women's condition. And at the time, I didn't realize what was happening. So I just said to her, what course are you teaching next semester? And for a year and a half, I was doing all her courses. And at the end of a year and a half, I said, oh my God, I don't want to go back to the mainstream. So, and then I, and that's when I made the jump and went straight into feminist theory. So while these things are happening to you, you don't know it's happening. It's, not, it, it's unfolding in a way because I had a career at ISA too as a research fellow mm -hmm. um, and a publication. When UE Press had started, they had offered me the job as editor for the press in the, in the early days. I was interviewed and, and, and I had been accepted, but I didn't want to be an editor. Even though they felt I was doing a good job, I wanted to do research. Mm -hmm. so, so it's kind of like things fall in place over your life. Um, but I've always kept the love for teaching. And I think the study of power, which attracted me to political science, manifested itself in feminist theorizing. Because mm -hmm. you know that in a lot of my books, you see love and power, confronting power, theorizing gender. Because when you're talking about inequalities and injustices, you're really talking about an equal, uh, asymmetrical distribution of power. Mm -hmm. So a fascination with political science from very early and what seemed like a much later understanding of feminist theorizing, they click and came together and gave me my insight in feminist theorizing. That I came, I, I came to terms with this as a relatively mature uh, PhD student. But I remember, for instance, that my, my first boyfriend, when, you know, when I got into that, 
and we are, we are very good friends. And he said to me, you, Dean, you were always like that. He said, you used to get so upset because we were like dating around 19, 20. So. And he said that I used to say at the time that I'm going to open a school for women and teach them to respect themselves and teach them how to be because I don't understand how in relationships they allow themselves to be treated like that. And I said to him, he said, yes, you don't remember saying that we would read something or hear something about somebody and you would get very upset. And of course, even back then in relationship, girlfriends at 18 or 19 would talk to me. They, they, they would talk to me and say to me, you know, please, 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 you know, help me understand this situation. And I would say, but you know, how we can't say this to you. I mean, it, what, what about what you need and what you want? And um, I remember another occasion, I had this boyfriend that I loved to life, you know, I mean, I really loved him, loved him, loved him. I was going away to study, and he wanted me to study somewhere else because it would be closer to him. Mm -hmm. and, and I could reconcile it in my head because NYU was a very good school, and he wanted me to go to a school in Florida, which would have been closer to him. And I said, no. I mean, I, and I really loved him, but, but, but I couldn't understand, but I figured, like, I need to be at this university. It was ranked second in public administration in the United States at the time. And he said, but well, if you really cared, you would have, you, I said, no, I mean, you already had your PhD, and I needed to get, get my master's. I, I was going for my master's. I need to get my master's at a good school. And I couldn't see why he felt that and I genuinely could not see it because I saw it as being very different. This was about me getting a degree at a very good school and not not wanting to be with you. And we would work it out and try to see each other. But people later say that these things are like feminist thought. And I don't know. And I I, I mean I, I, I told you in my introduction I was the last of six girls. And I had in our family my mother's children, mother and father, the first was a boy and the last was a boy. So the last was spoiled by everybody, including all the sisters and the mother and father, my mother and father. And my older brother was also spoiled by my sisters. He was a cricketer in Grenada. And my, my sisters would help wash his clothes, his cricket, the white things and the thing. I was very amused by all of this. And, and I mean, like my older sisters or my mother, when I was younger, would, would probably wash my clothes. But as soon as I became a teenager, I said, don't touch my things, I'm doing it. And my mother would say, you're always independent and own way because she would she naturally did the laundry but then she would talk during the week and say oh I have these daughters and they're pretty and they don't want to do their laundry and I say not me don't include me in that you can't take up my clothes when you're doing your wrongs and then talk about it and I insisted I would actually because she was doing it almost by rote and I, I would actually hide it so she wouldn't get it because I didn't like that uh, uh, with her saying that and I never understood how uh, automatically somebody's laundry belonged to you because you are female and the person is male, whether husband, boyfriend, uh, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Because I, I figure in a household, the laundry belongs to everybody and everybody should share it. And I don't know, my sisters didn't think that way. And I, and I don't know if it had something to do with the fact that I was the last girl. Mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, lots of my friends and family say that I always had signs of what would later manifest itself as feminist. But like, for instance, when I worked, on the, when I worked at ISA in the Women in the Caribbean Project, they, I wasn't working on the Women in the Caribbean Project. Roberta and Margaret Gill and Diane Cummins were. But I would ask them, what y'all doing? Mm -hmm. And I have always liked why. I don't like superficial answers. And at the point, I could not get a good answer as to the why, the, the in-depth at the time. And, uh, I, I did a project for Patty Manuel on looking at women as political leaders. He sent me through the Eastern Caribbean to interview women in politics. And I love that, up and down the Eastern Caribbean. But I've always wanted to go deeper. Um, so, so when I think that course at Howard made a number of things click in my mind. But another thing that's very important, even before I called myself feminist, I had started a women's group in the late 1980s called the Women's Forum. And I remember my son was months old. I was watching television. There was a television program with a Lombe Motley on discussing the budget and with a group of men talking about the budget. And I sat there with my son and I said, you know, it's interesting. Whenever there, there's something on the economy, the discussions are always men. 
and when it is on education and child care, the so-called soft subject, the discussion, the discussants are always women. But women can discuss anything, and men can discuss anything. So I wrote a group of friends and say, let's start this group, a, a policy group called the Women's Forum, and 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 discuss, you know, and operate as a pressure group. So the early signs, I guess, looking back, mapping back, were there. A, a, a very generic ordinary definition that I would like everybody to follow. I, I, I think of feminism as a belief that the inequalities that exist for women and a commitment to exposing and changing them. And, and, and that is, you have to start from the position there are things that are wrong, that are unequal. And actually they're very easy to verify objectively, historically, the, uh, the, the, the literature, the legislation, the practices, the denials. But, but, but so, so that these, these inequalities, these injustices exist and that you are committed to exposing them and to changing them and exposure could take many forms. It can be through research, it could be advocacy, it could be, you know, leg uh, doing re uh, lectures and so on. But the point is, by, by having a, a term such as exposure, you then plug in teaching, all those things come into thing. And changing it again, there are uh, uh, multiplicities of ways of changing it. But, but those three parts, I believe the inequalities exist, dedicated to exposing and dedicated to changing. And, and each one of those manifests itself differently. Has this always been your view of feminism? Yes, it hasn't changed. It really hasn't changed. You, I think you change the language depending on the audience. So if I were to go to a group of women to speak about feminism, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't use very conceptual, difficult language. Because I actually think that out of a respect for your audience, you should use the vocabulary that is commonly understood by everybody. It is not patronizing or seeking to talk down or anything. But if you really understood what you were talking about, right. you can put it in any language. And you don't, have, you don't have to hide it in an academic term as such. Mm -hmm. But but I really believe at, the, at its core that is what it is. Mm -hmm. So you want me to talk about how I come up with my definition of gender justice and or why I arrive at that as opposed to gender inequality. Right. right. Because I realize that you could equality means sameness. And women and men are not the same. Women are not supposed to be like men, and men are not supposed to be like women. Um, we have these, well, we, we could say we have third genders in the society, but even when we do that, and I'm still respecting the, the third gender, whatever multiplicity of gender, there is a sense in which you're moving from one to the other or moving away from. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of this conversation, let's talk about the two main, the two main sexes of which gender identities and, and, and gender orientations are mapped onto. And you, because society has primarily been about men for a very long time, when you talk about gender equality, generally it is like bringing women up to men. And, and then, but women are entering the playing field almost on the terms men enter. Immediately you're doing an injustice to, to, to women because you're asking them to become like men. And, I, and, and it is not taken into consideration the things that are unique about women, just as there are things that are unique about men. So that in a situation where you, if something is just, it may have to be organized differently rather than the same way. And, and, and so when you look at gender inequalities in the society, you may say women don't get an equal chance to participate. I have a seminar, I have my seminars only Friday evenings at five. The socialization patterns in the Caribbean and Barbados still is that most week from Friday evening, women start thinking about the house and the shopping and the laundry and whatever. Men tend to feel more relaxed on the evening. They go to the bars, they do whatever. If you, and these things have to change, but until they do, if I have seminars up here every Friday evening at five, I may not make it possible. I, I'm not choosing the best time for all women to attend. Because, because I'm ignoring the socialization patterns around women, and I'm saying anybody could come, but the time I choose is not an ideal time. And so the idea is that if something is, if you create a condition that is just, it does not penalize men, nor it does not penalize women, but it, it, it seeks to create a, a better qualitative condition 
within the society or the, 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 the social entity that you're looking at. So I realize equality is problematic, the, the notion of equality, because you're bringing one group equal and then you're basically sending out these messages that you are to behave in this manner. Why? As, as, as a leader within the university, uh, women in the corporate sector, why, As because I have noticed when women rise in the corporate world, they start dressing in dull colors. They start toning down. If, if, if being feminine in, in the traditional sense matters to you, prioritize and privilege that. Don't apologize for being woman. Mm -hmm. Do, just like we don't want men to apologize for being men or to, or, or to being in any ways you want to be. So, if, so whatever, whatever way a woman wants to be, that is fine. If she wants to be freely, fine. If she wants to be conservative, fine. If she wants to be muted, androgynous, fine. But don't set out one definition. And when you talk about equality, you are seeking to bring women along to this norm and to this standard. And I have always found that problematic. Well, I have to tell you, I, you asked me to, to speak to sort of the birthing of the Center for Gender and Development Studies, how it developed, and whether or not we would separate the academic from the activism. Right. And, and, and let me answer that last part first. No, it shouldn't be separated. Because part of how I approach the center, and I think if when you're a feminist and you're passionate about it, it, it is inextricably linked, right. and you can't separate it. I couldn't separate it. And I think my other colleagues couldn't. But I also felt that I was, as I suggested earlier, I was blessed to be in the position to start the Kville unit of the Center for Gender and Development Studies. And I remember when it started, I was, it, it was, there was a lot of skepticism on the campus. There was a lot of denial. What is this thing? What is that nonsense? I even had a secretary who tell me, she, she came to me and she said, she was the very first person, and she said, um, this thing don't fail here. And I need you to know that if I were you, I would try and get another job. And that um, this man who's senior in the university say, he don't know why Barito went and takes she good brain and waste it on this feminist stuff. And I look at her and I laughed. Um, because I have a lot of confidence. I don't know why. I have a lot of belief in self. I don't know why either. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think, again, my older sister says that I have been like, like, I have been like this as a child. Mm -hmm. But I just say, I didn't create the Center for Gender and Development Studies. The university created, and they're going to get it. Whether they like it or not, they're going to get it. And I'm saying this as one person in a little room with an uncooperative secretary who subsequently left. She left because she thought that she'd get it out before they shut it down. And, and that was fine, because when she left, I, also, I then got a very dedicated young woman who worked with me. But I, then I, I, I had by myself to devise a game plan where the university was like, where's she going with this? I mean, we created, but she taking it seriously. Because when I say creating it, the policy come from the headquarters, but on the campus. And I had this 15-year this strategy that I, I broke down into three five-year trunks um, or, or, or tranches. And I said, in the first five years, they're going to get visibility. After five years of gender studies being created, Nobody on this campus in Barbados is going to say they never hear about the Center for Gender and Development Studies. So in the first five years, if you, if you barely ask me, you didn't you want to? I say yes. So I was going on panel discussion. I was writing this. I was doing that. I was writing letters to the papers. But what I was doing was building visibility mm -hmm. and awareness. So eventually, people figure, oh, there is a Center for Gender and Development Studies. I worked very hard, but I enjoyed it because I was building visibility. Transitioning from visibility now, I, I had this notion of penetration, strengthening. So I, know the, I knew the next phase had to be the development of the scholarship in gender studies I, and, and, and the development of more courses so that the development of minors so you could bring people in. And so I, I remember getting together with Lyndon Lewis and Elysius Joseph and created the first two courses at UWI, not at Cavill, at UWI, at anywhere, 
on men and masculinity. Those two courses were written in 1996 and 1997. And I pulled, pulled on two men, uh, 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 I think both were sociologists, but Lyndon Lewis was, um, Elysius then, he was in the church. I don't think he was yet a full pastor, but he used to lecture up here. And I figured I needed men to talk about the issues of men and masculinity. And I realized we couldn't teach about women. Caribbean men are an intrinsic part of our lives and our society. And we need to understand them, but not from the perspective of compensatory masculinity, not for apologizing. I need to understand that they have needs and they have concerns and they're vulnerable like we are, and that a lot of how masculinity is performed and understood actually put burden on men. So it was a respectful creation of these courses. But, but the point is in that phase to create courses. The, the third phase was saturation, which is that an, 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 an expansive reaching out of gender studies so that you needed a postgraduate program because the postgraduate program is also replenishment. Mm -hmm. if, if you have people doing the minor, that is good, they could go on. But if you have people doing PhDs, they can come back and teach. They can create knowledge. So you are actually gener regenerating the discipline and you're institutionalizing it. So. I had this game plan in my head that I subsequently wrote down. But I, and I saw it from very early. So all the daunting criticisms, all the, the thing, I would have a temporary little setback, but I never lost the vision mm -hmm. that I would put gender studies on the map. And that a lot of the people who were then skeptical came back, the same woman who was the secretary who left, she came back, I can't say what she told me, um, and, and tell, but she, she came in my office, she said, Eudine, I have to talk to you. I made a mistake. I come and I would like you to kick me in the, for, 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 for really not believing in what you were trying to do. And now I see it and it is succeeding. Mm -hmm. and, and finding allies, finding people to work with that shared your vision was important. And, and recognizing the importance of getting good young women and men in and having them understand and take it forward. And right now, when I look at the Nita Barrow Unit and the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, I feel so satisfied. I say, well, I could go and plant peas in Tobago. I could go and crochet, because my work on this earth is done. In other words, there are good women there now, you and the others, who can take this work forward, regardless whether Eudine Barito is there or not. And because gender studies is institutionalized. They understand the importance of creating scholarship. They understand the importance of graduating other young women and men, because that is the next, that, then it lives. Mm -hmm. And I saw that, but I couldn't do that in year one to five. So you had to create the visibility, the penetration, the saturation and replenishment. Mm -hmm. and, and what all the ones who are there have to do, they have to build on whatever they inherited. You always have to build. And when they leave the stage, as that will happen in 30 years' time, the others who come after will have to build. Because it is, it is about succession planning. It is about understanding that what we are seeking to do is larger than us, and the respect for society. You, you want to know what my last day at the center was? Well, I think that it took me a while. When I left to become deputy principal, I was still officially the head of gender studies. I think it was only, I became deputy principal of the campus in 2008. And it was only in 2013, I think, or 14, that my post as head, because my substantive post was head of gender studies. And so the university couldn't appoint anyone, which is part of the university rules, not my rule as such. And I was always seen as the de facto head, although when I left, I sort of, this is yours, run with it. If you, want to con if you want to consult, fine, because I believe in mentoring, not mothering. Yeah. The difference for me is mothering, I'm not hovering. Mentoring, if you think I have something to say to you, if you think you can learn from me, then you seek me out. If you don't, I'm not going to come to you because I respect your chance to lead as you define. And, and, and I also think I can learn from you. So I don't have all the answers. Mothering is, is different. Mothering, you are the adult, and there's an a, a infant coming into a young person that you're raising. And at some point in life, you stop that. I clicked off being the full mother in terms of my relationship with my own son about 15. And we started having a different relationship. Like now we are very good friends. 
I'm his mother, we love each other, but we are very good friends. He's an adult, he's a man. And I saw him like that from the time he was about 17 going on 18. So I stopped the mothering, even though he would seek me out for advice. I, again, I would tell him, it's your life. If you don't ask me, I'm not, I don't have anything to say to you. Um, it, not, it doesn't brutal, but, but to have him arrive at making his own decision. And a relationship with, with scholars, junior scholars, is the same way. Mm -hmm. I would mentor, I would share advice, I would give you pointers, but you have to want it because I don't want you to think that I'm coming hovering and mothering because I'm not to mother you, you're an adult and you have to respect your intellectual processes, but I've had experiences that could be beneficial, may be beneficial, they don't have to be. So, but mentoring is, I also believe in mentoring, I, you know, like, uh, creating possibilities and showing possibilities, but to the heart of the question, I didn't, I, I think I, I, it was about three years before I realized I left gender studies in that sense. And I think I only knew it when I realized that I couldn't teach anymore, that the integrity of, of, of giving to the new position I'm in and also respecting the fact that if I step into the classroom, I want to be very well prepared. I want to, 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 to read everything I tell my students to read. I want to wallow in it and just revel in it. And if I don't have the time to do that, I am not doing it. I would do a public lecture. But, and I'm longing to go back into graduate teaching so that when I retire, I want to do some graduate teaching, if gender studies would have me. And I would, but if they don't, I would, I would sit and, and, and read and write and so on. But, but so the, officially, the day itself felt kind of, oh, oh, Lord, what is happening here? But it didn't feel like I was really gone. It took me a while to realize that, in, that I was gone in that sense. But, but it, it, it is also very necessary to leave because you have to create opportunities for others to shine. Mm -hmm. And I had been head for 15 years. And so and I, I've been grateful for the opportunity. It was time for other people to rise to the fore. And it was a good decision because I'm seeing the blossoming of good leadership coming out. So I'm very pleased about that. I'm going to speak to how being a feminist has informed my leadership style as principal and the fact that I, I watched a, a, a small unit grow. Well, I, I think gender studies really equipped me for the role of principal. I, I was deputy principal for a long time and had an excellent working relationship with my predecessor, the new, well, not new, but the vice chancellor, because he's two years as vice chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles. And we work very closely and we work very well together. A wonderful unit, a great man, a visionary, and created this wonderful campus. But stepping into the position is not the same thing as being number two. At number, when you step in, the box stops here. But again, and I was taken over at a time when it was very difficult. The government had imposed tuition fees. The students' number had declined. The economy had tightened. There were a lot of things that officially could be daunting. But I was not scared. I was not scared because I'm an incurable optimist and I had built gender studies and I also have a vision of where I want to go. And, and, I, and being feminist also put me in a position to create opportunities for people who would normally not be given a look in. And it is not only women. Women, definitely. They, so there are women that I try to expose to positions of leadership, but also some men. Because again, in terms of gender justice, I don't believe that gender justice means only creating opportunities for women. Gender justice means ensuring there is justice for all, irrespective of whether you're a man or a woman, and ensuring that there are no built-in inequalities around any one group. Mm -hmm. Now, historically, there, have, there has been built-in inequalities around women. So I would na naturally want to tackle those. But if I see anything that, that is penalizing men, I would want to tackle that too and would tackle it. And so as, uh, but again, the weight of the, the comments of the principal, I realize, matter very much. So I, I, would, I would select somebody who is young and give them opportunity, not from here to there, but let me see how you work at that level. And let me see and, 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 and have them understand that when you do something like that, you, you may not understand you're representing the campus on a, 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 another co a, a regional committee, but you're really developing your leadership capability. And I look to see if you, you want to do that, and I look to create opportunities for, for historically women didn't share 
equally in meetings. So I create opportunities to hear one's voice. But I don't condone foolishness from anybody, man or woman. So, so I am not going to, because I'm a feminist, it doesn't mean that women get a free pass. I, you have to work hard. You have to deliver. I, I believe in, in one developing one's integrity, whether man or woman. And so, and I, I would say for a lot of young women who want to be in the, the, uh, the academy, develop uh, personal integrity, be committed to scholarship, be committed to working hard, and be committed to giving off your best. And, and, but I would say the same thing to a man. But, but the, the, in, in the old system, there were opportunities that were created more for men than women. I'm not going to be part of that. I'm going to, to, to see to it that women also get a place at the table. And, and, and if I see a woman who is much better at a, for a leadership position, then she's going to get that leadership position. But, but again, in terms of gender justice, I really try to ensure that. So uh, what I've noticed, like almost all my deans are men. Only one is a woman. But they're all very comfortable working with me. They also know I'm not going to take any foolishness from them because I'm not shy and retiring. I understand that the buck stops here. I am, understand that I'm answerable to the Vice Chancellor and to the Caribbean public for the governance of the Cable Campus. So if something happens, I'm going to deal with it. And so I'm not going to be like a woman who's afraid to be in charge. I think you can't be like that in leadership. If you're in charge, you're in charge. Mm -hmm. but, but because the power of that, with power comes responsibility. And with responsibility, you have to have respect. Mm -hmm. So as, 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 as a woman in leadership, I have to respect the power that I can display or use and not abuse so, I mean, it. Pushback happens at every level. A lot happened in gender studies, and there, there is some pushback here. But guess what? When I sit here, um, you know, there are lots of things, for instance, if the principal doesn't take a decision, it does not happen. It doesn't mean that you go out there and say, oh, I'm not, you, you listen. You listen. I do a lot of consultation. I really, sometimes I go into a meeting feeling one thing. And then when I hear the consultation, I weigh, and I, I really go in with a very open mind, honestly, because I, I figure that, you know, I have to put myself aside and take up the responsibility of leadership, and the university is filled with intelligent people mm -hmm. at every level. That means you have to respect what they bring and you listen to them. Now, every now and again, you have a strong gut feeling about something and you go with that. Because ultimately, you have, as a leader, you have to be comfortable with what you finally, the decision you finally take. But, but I am willing, I, I have taken decisions already where I tell the staff, okay, uh, my the senior management, okay, my heart is not in this, but one, two, three, four, five, y'all feel strongly, prove me wrong. Because leave it to me, I would not support this. But you say this, and you say this, and y'all agree, so the principle is not going to be a holdout. I'm going to agree with you, but I don't believe in it. No, it has to be something that I also could feel. Because there are others, I, I, there, there, there have been situations where almost everybody in the room disagree with me, but I say, uh -uh. <laughs> and this one, this is what I decided, because I feel very, very strongly about that. But on the whole, I do a lot of consultation. And yes, it's pushed back because people have to get used to you and your style and, and also just the fact that you're a woman. Remember, I'm the first woman to head the Cable campus. And I'm doing so after an outstanding, strong, powerful leader of 15 years. I mean, you know, so Hillary Beckles wasn't shy and retiring, and he, and he had presence. And he was here not for two minutes, he was here for 15 years. So people are used to his style. And I was never going to be caught in, in, in walking in his footsteps. Impossible. And he had his style, and he made his an incredible contribution that I respect. One of the first things I did when I became principal was get a picture of the campus which I call the Becker's legacy, framed it and put it outside the office. And then I put the principals who pre preceded me, I framed them, th those pictures, and put it there. That, that wasn't there when he was principal, but I figured that was his contribution because he transformed, well, not, that, not the only contribution, but that he transformed Kayville. Mm -hmm. And I respect that incredibly. I respect his vision. And so, I mean, following him was quite easy because I'm not daunted by what he has achieved because I don't think I have to achieve that. I think if where I can, I can build on what I have inherited. And I've inherited so much 
building on it is quite easy because there's a foundation that is laid. And I think people again misunderstand. It is not, it is like whatever other people give to you is like a gift. Look at this building. This is an incredible building. I was in Guyana two weeks ago and I was boasting to the Ghanaians. We have an administrative block that is shaped like the Ashanti stool. Mm -hmm. And the Ashanti, he came and turned the sod. All that is the doing of my predecessor. So it, it, it is, it, and, and when I leave, the other, whoever becomes principal, they also inherit that. So you build on what you inherit and you're not daunted by it because you cannot compete with it. That is someone's legacy. And you make your contribution in the best way you can, mm -hmm. which is how I, how I see it. Oh, oh, no, it was a wonderful joy. And I, I, I think he's the son of a feminist mother. And he's a normal young man who is, when I say, you know, he's not a saint. He's not a demon. He's just a regular young man in, in the Caribbean, Barbadian young man. But, but, but he has a very clear understanding of my work and a great respect for it. And I think it started a lot by me respecting him. Mm -hmm. I took being a mother be very seriously. Like I figure, you know, being a mother, you're pregnant for a while. So it's a decision you're taking to bring someone into the world. And I have prioritized that. So I figure, and I, I figure the mothering period, even though the relationship changed when I, and I consciously changed that relationship when he was about 15, 16, I saw myself as having full responsibility for him from birth to 18. And what I meant by that, and when, at 14, I would say to him, um, you know, when you become 18 years old and you do something that breaks a law, regardless of if I boil or, ball or not, the police gonna put their hand in the back of your pants and hold you up so and <laughs> take you away, right? So that and at 18 years old, you are an adult. So we have to understand, you know, what that means. Our, our relationship would always continue, but the law and society relate to you differently. Mm -hmm. So if the police come knocking for you at 18 years old, I can't say, oh God, leave my son, you can't do that, right? But, so I had a responsibility from birth to 18 for this young man. But even as a, a little t toddler and growing, I respected him and respected that I had a responsibility for shaping a mind. And when I, when, you know, when I traveled, I would take him with me whenever I could, whenever I could, if it, it wasn't disruptive. And I, 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 I factored him into my life. I went to the to Uni University of Toronto in 1997 to inaugurate the Women in Development Fellowship held in honor of Dame Nita. Okay. And, and the first thing I said to them when they wrote to me and they said, we would like you to come to do that. I, have, I said, I have a son who's about seven years old. He has to come with me because I'm not going anywhere for three or four months. I, I would leave him like Halima and do the university travel a week, max two weeks, but not three, four, five months. I said, you know, he's not going to be your, your responsibility, but what you have to do for me, if you want me to come, because <laughs> if you want me to come, you have to find a school for my child. And you have to find a school. If I have to pay a fee, fine. But the school has to be near the university where I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. And so they said, all right, because I'm doing all this negotiation, because I'm not going if it is not right for him. And then, so they found the school, and they, I, I had to develop a postgraduate course and teach it. And they said that, um, so it's, it's PhD students I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. So the, the PhD classes are seven to nine. So I said, um, no, I'm not teaching seven to nine. Um, I would either teach nine to, to 12 or 12 to three. And they said, why? I said, because my son would be in school at the time. And, and, and seven to nine, he's, you know, he needs to do homework and so on. And they said, oh, but he could be in the classroom. I said, no, no, he's not a burden. I'm not having no child like no in the classroom. I'm not taking him from Barbados For, without his father, his family, his friends. And I am teaching and he lay down in a, a bench in the classroom. You know, it, I have a choice. If I didn't have a choice, fine. But I have a choice and I'm not punishing my son. Mm -hmm. so, so that PhD class was taught. 9 to 12 at the University of Toronto because I wasn't going. And, and um, I, I mean, they wanted me. I was honored. I was thrilled. But I was going to come on, you, on, on my terms. And, and he saw, because I figured that, that, real, that, that the early years mattered very much. The other thing, we had a lot of conversation. I listened to him a lot. And we did a lot of things together and helped to shape how he thought. I remember when he was about 9, maybe a little younger, he wanted to take some chocolates to, to, to school for a girl on Valentine's Day. This, and, and we learn so much. You, you learn a lot from your children. So 
he, he told me about it, and I said, how nice. And so the next morning, I get up, I put in a nice little gift bag and tie a ribbon on it. And then he didn't want to take it, it looked kind of girly. This is what he said. He said, Mommy, I, I'm not walking to school with this, with this gift for Crystal. If Crystal here is because she knows who she is. Um, um, and with this little bag, it looked girly. I said, no, it doesn't look girly. It looks like a gift for a girl. It doesn't mean, it's not girly. You are bringing a gift for a girl. And he said, oh, all right. And he took it. And when he came back home in the afternoon, he was evening, he was very, very annoyed. I asked him what happened. He said, when he bring it, and these are his words, seven or eight, he said, Crystal, snatch it. And she run with all the girls at the back of the classroom. And they say, what could Cabral give you? And they all eat the chocolate. He said, mommy, she ain't even tell me thank you. But that wasn't the part that was bothersome to me. And this is happening in the 90s when I teach in gender studies and I rage in with building the center and I listened to this little boy talk. A teacher had been selling roses, plastic roses for $3. And the other boys had bought plastic roses for the girls. He was the only one who brought chocolate. No, he didn't buy a chocolate. He took up my chocolate at home, but I didn't mind and, I, and bring for, for Crystal. He said, when the girls see the chocolate Crystal had, they went back and say, I can't call the boys' name because if they hear this, because they're all friends still, all of them. And they just say, Steve, Steve wasn't in the class. Ha, huh, Steve, have for this rose. I don't want it. And the girls gave back some of the boys the rose because they wanted chocolate. No, I was very, I was very disturbed by this as a feminist. That, he, that first he said that Crystal didn't give him anything because he expected a gift from her. She didn't tell him thank you. She told him to give and run with her friends. And the other girls then said they don't want a rose, they want chocolate. And I'm saying how little girls are eight already making that decision. You see, when we talk about gender systems, the message is coming from somewhere else. I found him in another one that, 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 that shows up how boys think, and I had to talk to him about that. The, the last week in class now, the 11 plus, they pass and they're going to the exams. So time to do something for Miss Holder, who was their teacher. And he come home, he blue vex, he blue vex, he quarreling with the girls, and the girls selfish, and the girl, the, all the girls in the class selfish, and the bad minded, and, they, they, and, and, and I say, okay, yes, what happened? And all the boys vex with them, what happened? They had a function for Miss Holder. I say, yes, and what happened? And the girls give Miss Holder a gift. And I say, OK, how many girls give it? So it's not the class. No, the girls say the gift is for Miss Holder. So I said, well, where are the boys? They didn't include us, mommy. So I said, well, how do you mean they didn't include us? They include y'all. The girls put together, and they buy a gift for Miss Holder. They made a gift. And I said, well, what y'all what, what did? Well, mommy, lunchtime, we went playing. I say, oh, so the girls staying at lunchtime and did something for Miss Holder, and then y'all went playing, and now y'all vexed that Miss Holder know that y'all weren't part of the gift. But y'all made a choice. Now y'all need to go and collect some money and buy Miss Holder a gift before it's too late. So I was help, I helped him to see, no, you can't get vexed with the girls, because they gave up their lunch hour to do something for Miss Holder, and y'all wanted to piggyback on it, and you didn't get to piggyback. So you can't be vexed. So, but, and then he saw that. So, you, you, you know, it's a daily thing. I remember once he came home from Queen's College and he was very upset and because the girls in fifth form were not then wearing skirts. They were wearing overhauls and the girls had to get to, only when they get to sixth form, they could wear a skirt and a blouse. And the girls were upset then and the boys were wearing long pants from form four. And some of the girls were complaining and he joined with them and signed petition and he tell me, the other boys tell him, Cabral, you only doing that because your mother is a feminist woman at the university. And he said, well, mommy, I don't understand because we get a form four. From form four, we can wear long pants. And the girls still in the little bitty things. And in fifth form, the girls still got that. I think it's unfair. So, you know, I would smile to myself because there were things he started taking for granted about how women and men should be without realizing it. And what was a joy, every now and again, he would make a joke with me as a fifth former and start calling concepts in feminist theory. And he would sit down and call out names and say, I wonder if Barbara Bailey wants to write on educational inequality. But perhaps Elsa Leorini would take it up. But maybe Jocelyn Messiah. So I said, Cabral, how, how you know these names? And he said, Mommy, all, all the years of listening to you on conversations. And, and so he would throw out concepts and just like play with me um, on it. But, but he grew with an appreciation. And, and there were many examples of, of 
little inequalities for men that uh, are boys that teachers are not aware of. He would say to me, Mommy, every time the teacher line us up, she always let the girls walk in first. All the girls go in first and then the boys. I said, well, she could alternate it. She could let the boys go in sometime. And then another time they had a bus tour to Farley Hill. And I got the rawness of a young boy hearing me talk about inequality and gender. Jesse, come home and say, Mommy, I got a gender injustice for you. We were on a bus to Farley Hill and the teachers let where the bus full up with the girls sitting down. And some of the boys had to stand up, and I had to stand up too. And just like them could get tired, I could get tired too. And the teachers let all the girls sit down. I said, but you know where that come from? He said, it's unjust, mommy. It's unjust. I said, well, yes, I agree with you. They could share the girls and the boys sitting down and standing up. But you know where it come from? There was an intrinsic belief that women are weaker than men. And I said, the teachers never stopped to think about it. He said, well, I'm only like nine or eight or whatever, and my, my nine-year-old we, knees weak too, and I need to sit down too, and then get... So it was that, those kind of little things that made you stop and think that teachers also need an understanding that there, there are things they may do that, that they haven't even thought about mm -hmm. that could create, cement the traditional gender roles and hierarchies. As a feminist and as a mother, I enjoyed motherhood. I still enjoy motherhood. And I think the greatest achievement of my life was having my son. I, 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 I'm really proud. I've, I've achieved a lot in life, but I think the thing that gives me the greatest joy is that to know I have contributed a normal human being. And uh, the way I like to put it is if an old lady or old man walk in the streets at night and my son is approaching, they don't have to cross the other side. In fact, he's the kind he would ask them if they have a lift because when... And, and and when he was like um, in fifth form, I was like, okay, you, when he started driving, you can't take home the whole school, you know. But he said, mommy, that you that taught me to be kind. And I said, no, but you're rinsing yourself. You're going up in St. Joseph and you're going here and you're getting. Because I, I remember another time at fifth form, he come home quarreling. But I, I always, you know, he's very open and conditions of inequality always bother him of all kinds. So um, what had happened, the, the lady, the janitor, tell him, tell the class that when they leave on evening, they must put the chairs on the desk so that she could sweep the room. So when he was calling I he said, Mommy, everybody's run out, and I put all the chairs on the desk every evening by myself. I said, well, why you alone have to do it? He said, because he had his own key, and I feel sorry, let's say, for Miss Brown, because she got to come in, and then she got to move it. So he, he felt sorry for her. He's going to help her, but getting a feeling oppressed now because nobody else helped. But I said, well, hold on to a couple of your friends and help her because it's not fair to her, and you shouldn't have to do it all by yourself. But conditions of inequality really matter um, to him. And I think by constantly pointing up inequalities, um, when you get to raise your child, and when you hope feminist mothers and fathers can make a difference in helping them to... Because you can't be feminists and oppose the gender inequalities and quite comfortable with racial inequalities or any other form of inequality. I mean, to be opposed to one inequality, you should be opposed to all. And this is why a commitment to justice, especially social justice, uh, takes care of that. So he, he's, he's very conscious of different forms of oppression. And I think, and I, I like to think that I had a part in that. And that, and, and that we can do that. And we recognize you can't change the world, but you can call attention to things and even help people to see things differently. You, uh, you asked me what I think about my legacy or how I think people will think about me or how I would like them to think about me. And to be quite honest, Leanne, I have never stopped to think about that. And I don't even know what to think about because I, have, I, I think if I have any weakness at all, it is that I never look back. I never look back, and sometimes I forget the things that I do. I spent six months in the Philippines on a scholarly training program, and only certain things would trigger that I did that. Um, I would be working on a project, or I, I a research paper, a book, whatever, and when I finish, I put all the papers together, I close it, I put it on a shelf, and I say, Lord, what is the next thing I have to do? So I, 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 I am very serious. I never. Every now and again, I go somewhere, and, and when I'm being introduced, and they read my CV, and they do the highlight, and I say, I really did those things? Because I don't, I don't dwell on it, and, um, and I always think, in, like right now, I'm really caught with all the things I need to do to bring money into Cable Campus, all the things I need to do to create scholarships, 
all the things I need to do to advance internationalization. So as a result, and I've only been here two years, so I don't know what, you know, we can't think of achievements in that sense. And again, when I left gender studies, I, I realized I worked very hard. I mean, I saw things that I did, but while I was doing them, I wasn't seeing them. And I remember the first time I had a sense of it, somebody was saying to me, but you did all of that without staff. Because I, it, at, at first I had a secretary, and then a little while after I got a research assistant, and then it took about 10 years before they gave me a position of a lecturer. And when I was, I, was, I became campus coordinator in 2004 for the School for Graduate Studies and Research. And I was head of gender studies and campus coordinator together for four years and teaching. And so at that time, I, I, I was just like, oh, I got to prepare these lectures. I got to make sure I may write this paper for grad studies. Um, and I, you know, it has subsequently changed that a campus coordinator does this and a head do that, you know, so it, it has changed in that sense. But I don't, I, I really don't know what, um, you know, what my legacy would be. Um, I'm, I'm forced to think about it. And I think, I think, you know, that, that is a difficult question because I don't think that you ought to shape how people will remember you. People have to determine that. I was tempted to say that I, but it's almost facetious and conceited to say I would like to be remembered as having done this and that. Because even though you say that, if people think you haven't done it, people have to determine that. I, I, I'm, very, I'm very serious. I, I, um, I, haven't, I haven't put a lot of stock on, on legacy. Um, so I think I think that is going to have to be fed up if there is one. Honestly, I haven't I haven't thought about the legacy. I know I have been committed to justice. I know I have been committed to creating opportunities, and that matters very much to me. Opening doors because a lot of doors have been open to me, um, and I would not have been here today if people hadn't seen something in me and feel the need to invest in it even when I couldn't see it in myself. So I try to do that with others. And, and that matters very much to me. But, but it doesn't mean that other people will believe that I've done it. And I am not vested in saying I want to be remembered like that. Okay. So, so I, I, I can't say what, y'all will have to tell me, I can't say what that <laughs> legacy would be. <laughs> Well, certainly, I, I feel almost duty bound to say, duty bound because at the time it was happening, I didn't understand it, but it, it was such a pivotal decision. And I was glad that I was able to see her before she died. The headmistress of uh, St. Matthias Girls School, who wrote that letter to have me transferred from St. Matthias Girls School to Ellerslie Secondary. I have just known her last name, uh, uh, Miss Smith. But certainly the fact that she was convinced that I needed to go to a secondary school matters significantly because it changed. I was at a school where then in the late 60s, I could have finished school at 14 or 16. And, you know, what a different outcome. So the fact that she gave me an opportunity to go to a, uh, a secondary school and get all levels, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely and eternally grateful for that. When I got to LSD secondary, my favorite teacher was a man called Alfred Trotman. And I later found out he was an early graduate of the UWI Cable campus because his picture is on the wall just outside the, um, our council room. Of, there's a picture with some early Cable graduates. And I said, God, look, Mr. Trotman. When I was at school, I didn't know that. But he sort of, he and another teacher called Yvonne Clark, who is now Yvonne Ford, they really believed in me. And at school, I used to say, well, I wish the two of them would leave me alone. They were, they were always entering me into competitions and asking me to write this essay. And especially, well, you know, at school, you would say Trotman, not to his face, but especially Trotman. Trotman had me in this competition, this debating thing, this. And he would say, you didn't buy it, oh, you're a bright girl, you're playing fool, you're a bright girl, you're a bright girl. And that playing the fool meant that I didn't get exactly what he wanted me to get. Mm -hmm. And um, he taught me history, and history was my best subject at Ellerslie. Um, I did well in all the others, but I loved it because he made it come alive. And, um, and he really gave me, he believed in me and gave me a lot of confidence in my abilities and would keep pushing me a lot. And I, 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 and I did, in the early pushing, I did it because of respect for him, because Mr. Trauma wanted me to be in this competition. 
because I didn't see in me what he had seen. You know, and, as an adult, I think he saw more than I could as a, as a little teenager. But, but certainly his belief in me gave me confidence uh, or it reinforced whatever nascent confidence I in fact had. And, and, and at Cable campus, there were lots of people I looked to as mentors, Patrick Emanuel, Jocelyn Messiah. Later in my working life, Elsa Leoraini was, was incredible. She was the first head and professor of gender studies and a, a, a very strong university woman, a very good feminist and scholar. Um, and certainly Jane Flax was pivotal in my life. Jane Flax, um, she ended up being the supervisor of my PhD thesis. And I would, I, I would go to conferences and make presentations. And when I finished, people would come to me and say, where did you study? And I would say, how would you, you study at Howard? And who did you study with? Oh my God, you study with Jane Flax. Oh my God, you know, I like, so she had a lot of respect out there. And we still remain very good friends. But, and just right within my family, my mother, an incredible, strong, incredibly strong woman, and all my sisters who I love to life. And great friends, good friends that have, the, the names that I call to you, Diane and Margaret and Joy and Sonia and, Pat, people, Rhoda, we remain friends today. So you learn from each other and you grow and, um, and, and people reflect to you possibilities and you are eternally grateful. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this program. Remember, you can watch this and all our programs on our website, www.uetv.org, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Also, join the conversation on social media by visiting our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages.